ACNFers, a lot of you know that I like to crack open a beer from time to time on this podcast. Sometimes it contains alcohol, other times it's a near beer. I've been selected as a brand ambassador for Athletic Brewing, a brewery that makes my favorite non-alcoholic beer. Shout out to Free Wave, my favorite hazy IPA by them. And if you use the promo code BRENDANO20 at checkout, you get 20% off your first order. Head to athleticbrewing.com and order yourself some of the best non-alcoholic beer I think you'll ever drink. I mean it. Also, I don't get any money. I get points towards flair and beer, but no money, okay? Full transparency. Go check it out. Like, I have a friend who I love, but who refers to what we do as a craft and I recoil every time I hear that. Like I'm not, Hemingway was a craftsman. I am not, you know, I'm a bricklayer. Hey there, CNFers, CNF pod, the creative nonfiction podcast, a show where I speak to badass people about the art of telling true stories. I'm Brendan O'Mara. How's it going? Today's guest is million time bestselling author, Jeff Perlman. His newest book, his 10th with a T, is The Last Folk Hero, The Life and Myth of Bo Jackson. It's published by Mariner. Jeff also is the author of Showtime, The Bad Guys Won, Boys Will Be Boys, and Sweetness. It's Walter Payton, for those in the know. He's the host of the great writing podcast, Two Writers Slinging Yang. We're a couple of boats floating in the tide, trying to rise all these boats, if you know what I mean. He's big time CNFers. Show notes to this episode and a billion others. They're at brendanamero.com. Hey, hey. There you'll also sign up to my up to 11 Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter. This is where it's at, CNFers. I'm not one to hang out on social media. I hate it. But I am one to put a lot of effort into my kick-ass newsletter that entertains, gives you value, and sticks it to the algorithm right up its keister. And you know that I do occasionally have a CNF and happy hour for those who want to come spend 40 minutes because ain't nobody springing for that big Zoom account. Uh, If this is your thing, by all means, sign up. Been doing it for a lot of years. First of the month, no spam. As far as I can tell, can't beat it. I once had the Bo Jackson baseball card where he was wearing the shoulder pads, then he had a bat across his shoulders, and the back of the card just said Bo in giant letters. I think it was blue and green, but I could be making that up. I watched that cartoon with Bo Jackson, Wayne Gretzky, and Michael Jordan back in the day. It was called Pro Stars. Here's the description. Three of the most famous sports stars of the day. Basketball star Michael Jordan, hockey star Wayne Gretzky, and baseball star Bo Jackson. No no mention of football there. Team up to respond to emergencies around the world. Wow. The actor Dave Fenoy was the voice of Bo Jackson. That's right. The athletes didn't even voice themselves. One season, 1991, 13 episodes. Anyway, Jeff is a very polished interviewee, far more polished than I am as an interviewer, mind you. A, he's a former Sports Illustrated senior writer. He's one of the good guys, if you ask me. There's Some people come and they don't play ball. Some headliners come on the show and mail it in. Jeff mailed nothing in. Is that is that even how you would do that? Anyway, he came to play ball. Riff. I came across a quote. One of my favorite Instagram accounts to follow is this. Um, it's niche or something, I, and uh, it, it's usually just great literary quotes or from, great, from sort of rogue artists. And, uh, you know, one one today was uh, from Jack Kerouac, and it just says, it's very simple. It just says, scribbled secret notebooks and wild typewritten pages hmm. for your own joy. Yeah. And I wanted to just run that by you because it seems like when you're in your writing, you, a, lot, a lot of times you're having a, I can tell you're having a good time. So I just wanted to see see what's going on in your brain when you, when you hear that. I mean, I was actually thinking the opposite. I mean, it's... Um... There's a lot I love about <laughs> about it all, but it's also torture. It really is. So I yeah. can't, it's, I always think like, um, 
when I wrote Three Ring Circus about the Shaq Kobe Lakers, I I never really thought of it this way, but I think about I think about Kobe a lot. And Kobe played for the Lakers and he was this guy who was a famous superstar and cross promotions and blah blah blah. But like he also was the guy in the gym shooting a thousand jumpers with the lights dimmed and nobody else around. And a lot of that is writing. Like a lot of that really is writing. It's, it's torture. It's you thinking everything sucks. Every mistake burning out your soul. Like I literally today, book came out today. Someone DM me and he said, Oh man, congrats. I'm loving the book. I spotted one error. And oh, no. as soon as I see that my heart just sinks. Right. And it was, I misspelled a name uh, instead of D E um, a N I had a D E A N it's supposed to be D E E N and it's D E E N and it's one error, right? It's one tiny error. 99 out of a hundred readers will never have any idea that I made that error. And I will remember that not joking 10 years from now. I'll remember that. I'll remember that error. Cause that stuff tortures me more than the high I get out of things. So it's, yeah, it's great, but it's torturous at the same time. Truly. That, that kind of goes back to your bullpen days where at, at SI when uh, when people would write a story and oftentimes you wouldn't know how you messed up until a writer would write a physical letter in with something of that nature and you'd be like, ah, oh, God damn it. <laughs> like, that yeah. sucks. Yeah, yeah, that happens. I mean, it's just, it's just hard. It's all really hard. I love writing books. I love that I get to do this. The one thing I never thought about when I started is that would it would allow me to be a very present father and attend every event and be there for everything. But um, you do beat the crap out of yourself. And there's a lot. I don't know why I'm in this mood to talk this way, but you do. You beat your crap out of yourself. And I'm exhausted physically and mentally. It's it's a great job. But it's when people give like romantic quotes about writing, I, I'm always <laughs> like, yeah, I guess. But it's hard. It's hard. I see why writers drank a lot it, in the day. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And it's, uh, but it is, uh, you know, as, as great a thing as it is that we get to do, it is hard and you always have those dark nights of the soul, the the ugly middles of drafts where you're a little too far away from the shore to swim back and turn around and you're yeah. too far away from the lighthouse to feel any good about what you're doing. Yeah. And it's like, you do have to wrestle with those, with those thoughts. And so, it, it's very natural. How, how do you wrestle with those thoughts when you're just like, oh man, this is shit. Everything I put down is garbage, but I somehow need to persevere. I just, I don't really have an option. You know, it's like when people say, how do you write the writer's block? Right. To me, the answer is what mm -hmm. choice do I have? I have to write the writer's block because this is what I do for a living and I, I can't not get the book done. So the same with everything. Like there are points when I'm writing a book and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And my wife will be like, but you don't really have a choice. Like you have to do it. So take your little break, do your little pity party, go listen to some Tupac and then start writing again and just do it. And you do it. And the thing is you, a lot of times you'll put crap down on the page. Like it is not good, but it's on the page and that's a start. Just getting stuff on the page. You can always go back later and clean it up. It's the best you can do. Yeah, I read a quote from Lee Child today on on Lit Hub. He was asked about writer's block, and uh, you know he doesn't believe in it. And he's just like, "Do nurses get nurses block? Do truck drivers? Of course, there are days when you would rather do nothing, but you have to get on." A truck driver climbs in the cab, checks the mirrors, checks the dials, turns on the engine preheater, clips the seatbelt, starts the motor, yeah. and then muscle memory clicks in, and the day starts. Same for writers. I turn on the computer, reread yesterday's stuff, and off I go. Yeah, I don't uh. <laughs> I guess so. I, I get what he's saying. I uh, I always hate when people are like established writers are like, oh, there's no such thing as writer's block or blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, it's real. <laughs> people go through it and they suffer through it. I don't actually have problems with writer's block. Not not really. I have problems with just being tired, <laughs> you know, and like I'm just yeah. tired. But I don't really like the dismissal of writer's block. Like it does suck. When it, we all have moments where you're staring at a blank screen and nothing's coming to you and you just think it sucks and you don't have anything there. It's real, you know, and the best thing I always find when I struggle writing, no matter the cause, truly, is I get up, I take a walk, I take a shower, I put on some Tupac or some Hall and Oats or some whatever, and I just sort of have a drink and just try to get back at it. You know, it's hard. Oh, you know, when when I feel stuck or something, and maybe in the same way that a musician might feel stuck, they might be like, you know, I'm going to go pull down this this record. I'm going to listen to some tracks and be like, kind of fill the tank in that way. 
I think, uh, you know, if you look at your bookshelf, too, and you view it kind of like an album collection, you'd be like, you know, there's this one Gary Smith story or a story from Bill Knack or you you name any SI alum or just, you know, peers like Howard Bryant. And you're like, let me just put a few of those sentences, inject them into my brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that might give me some some of that kind of inspiration. I, I know that kind of helps me to kind of. You know, pull 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 a track down and like put put a book on like on the CD player and see what happens. Well, it can also have the negative impact of you read Howard Bryan and you think I can't write like this. <laughs> I'm not a good <laughs> person. What am I going to do? So it has that too. But I yeah yeah I actually I think sometimes like Al, if I'm really struggling, I'll pull out an old Sports Illustrated or pull pull out a Howard Bryan book or a Jonathan I book or whatever, and I'll almost copy their first few sentences. Like I'll I'll fill in my names and my information. And it'll just get me going. And I'll usually change it later. It's nothing like, not like plagiarizing anything they do, but like maybe there's a Rick in Howard's Ricky Henderson book. Maybe he starts a sentence with like, you know, in the fall of blah, 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 the air was crisp and Ricky Henderson was blank. And maybe I'll be like, oh yeah, all right. That's not a bad tone. In the summer of blah, 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 Bo Jackson fell. And you sort of just work it out in your head. That's not a bad way to go about it, actually. No, no. And I was struggling with trying to come up with a, for a book proposal I'm, I'm doing about a, um, just having a more sort of, uh, you know, just painting a scene of this one particular area. And I was going through a lot of my John McPhee books and I really, I stumbled on uh, the, the opening to the Pine Barrens and just the way he went about sort of almost itemizing what it looks like. And I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. I, I'm going to just copy that, but I'm going to input all the more tactile geographic uh points of interest that i'm working with and it really it it was modeling it wasn't plagiarizing a lot like Uh, what you were saying yeah also nobody's no thought is truly original i mean everything's been no repeated but yeah and also like i i always tell i teach adjunct journalism in a school in southern california chapman university and i'll say like really writing is a lot like talking and kind of like you saying about you know mcphee and lists you can just be like if you're describing something, maybe you would just say the applesauce was brown. It, you know, it had little specks of apples in it. The cap was green. The bottle was see-through. The label was white with small writing and times font. Like that's perfectly fine writing. Sometimes you just do it that way. And I think as uh, as sports writers, sometimes it, what gets lost is actually talking about reading and the importance of the great books that have come before what we have, what we are trying to do. And I, uh, what books are very formative for you in the, in the sports canon and maybe outside of the sports canon that informs the work you do? Um, I would say in many ways, the most important book for me was the autobiography of Malcolm X. I read that one when I was in high school and I grew up in a very sort of small rural, AKA white conservative MAGA neck of upstate New York. And Obviously, there was no MAGA when I was in high school, but I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and it just opened my eyes to a lot of things. And I think that book really helped me think about sort of diversity, diversity of culture, diversity of religion, diversity of thought, which is actually more important than one might think when you're covering sports, which is a very diverse landscape. The other thing that just had a huge, huge, huge impact on me, and this is going to make me sound not that literary, but just being honest, is um, reading Sports Illustrated and reading Sport Magazine when I was a kid and learning to study them, not just read them for entertainment, but the way uh, transitions were written, the way a lead would start off, uh, the way you'd introduce new characters, like just word choice. I remember uh, I was reading a story years and years ago and the writer used the phrase whereof he speaks and he no, no, he knows whereof he speaks. And um, I've used that a million times since then. I don't even know why I just loved whereof he speaks So just paying attention to little things. And also when I was a kid, there used to be these books, the complete handbook of pro football, pro basketball, and and major league baseball. And they would come out, they were like yearbooks, but with really great sharp writing. And I would run to Walden books and buy these books and just absorb them, just absolutely absorb them. And they really informed my writing, I got to say. So I'm not overly intelligent. I'm not like super well read. I can't, I'm not going to lie to you and say I've read all the classics. But um, I do try to pay attention to the word choices and what devices people use. Yeah, when I was uh, in several conversations I've had with Glenn Stout, uh, he he would say like, you know, you know, Brendan, if you're ever stuck, you know, just pull down a best American sports writing and just shotgun leads. 
and he's just like just get those into your into your system and like look at the like you were saying look at the word choice how are they framing this how are we getting into a scene how are we hooking a reader and so forth and it's uh it's things that i don't think get talked about enough that that is part of the the game tape of being a writer going to the film and seeing how it's done so you can you can contend with it and contest with it and learn from it really million percent million percent i am again i keep i have all these sports illustrated under my office futon to my wife's great dismay and because there's <laughs> a ton of space and they're old and they're yellowed but i am um, i'll pull one out if i'm struggling just to read through it and you'll read an old rick riley piece or an old bill knack piece and it just really gets your juices going and kind of reminds you oh this is how you write and maybe i can't be as good as bill knack or rick riley but i can find inspiration from them and what I what I love about you know your podcast and how you speak about writing is that it really is uh, a lot about community. And I've also heard you talk about how you used to be very competitive, and I think this this gnaws at a lot of writers, especially young writers, and that uh, eventually you try to eschew that as you mature. Um, but what's your relationship to how you transition from being competitive to being someone who is more in uh, in tune with building community around this instead of being adversarial? Well, I think at some point I, I learned that someone else's success is not an, an indicator of anything I've done. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. today, just an example, Jamel Hill's memoir comes out it's the same day my Bo Jackson book comes out. There would have been a point in my life where internally, maybe I would have rooted for Jamel not to do well, you know, because why is her book selling and my book isn't selling? And just, I'm using Jamel as an example because we have books out there. Yeah. That could be anyone. And, um, I want Jamel to sell a million copies. And if Jamel sells more copies than me, that's great. Great for Jamel. It's a 0% reflection on me. It's a reflection on her and her success and her quality work. Every now and then, like one of those old feelings will creep up in me. You see someone do well and you think, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, wait, what, what are you doing? Like, it does not, why would you root against someone? Also, if books sell well, that's good for the industry. I don't care if it's yeah. Jamel's book or Snooky writing, you know, Jersey Shore too. Like, <laughs> People buying books and reading is good for us. So somewhere along the way, honestly, I just stopped being an asshole. Like I was an asshole at the Nashville, Tennessee in my early job. I was an unambiguous asshole. It was all about me. It was all about my career. It was all about my rise. It was all about my writing. I was better than everyone else. I didn't need an editor. I didn't need any help. I turned down offers of mentorship from writers who I should have. I never understood. And the thing that I really look back at was shame is um, I didn't understand what it meant to be a good writer. Like um, there would be guys who covered Tennessee State football or local high school sports. And I thought, well, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. Not realizing they embedded themselves in the schools. They had the phone number for the coaches. They knew everything about the team. They studied, studied, studied. They had contacts out the, you know, at the wazoo. I didn't have any of that. I just could turn a quick phrase every now and then. And over time, I've really learned to appreciate what it means. I think what it means to be a journalist. Yeah, you. Um, yeah, you write. About, well, you, you talk about that on on your uh, sort of. Uh, oh, what's the, the 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 podcast about you being in the bullpen and how like one of your diary entries was talking about like when you were getting elevated uh, out of the bullpen to more of a, a reporter writer, and you're like you, you didn't want to surrender your style or something. Yeah. And you're like, what the yeah. fuck? I don't, I don't even have a style yet. <laughs> like, I who still, the fuck is this guy? Embarrassing. And like, <laughs> that's the thing. I'm not, I've just learned over time. Like number one, you know, whatever you have a book come out and people make a big deal of you for a few days and it's, it's exciting. It is exciting. And you go on TV. Like I was on the today show yesterday. That's a perfect example. I was on the today show yesterday and for my parents, it's huge. And for everyone's it's huge. And for me, it's exciting, but I'm, I am well aware that I'm no more worthy of being on the Today Show than the guy sweeping the street in front of the Today Show. You know, like that job is no less or more valuable than my job. It just isn't factually. And in fact, that guy is probably busting his ass to feed his family and deserves far more credit than I do. Me having my parents paid for my college education and having a pretty easy life. So I just, I just over time am far less impressed by this job and definitely what I do than I used to be. Now, a few few months ago when I was speaking with uh, David Marinus about his Jim Thorpe biography and doing research on him, you know, his, his, uh, on Marinus, like his big thing on writing biography, he calls it like the four legs of the table, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with. 
Um, but it's like, you know, go there if you can go there. Um, interview everybody, basically. Uh, get the documents and try to get beyond the mythology. And I wonder, in, in over the course of your now 10 books and several biographies, you know, what have you found to be true about doing biography and doing it well? I mean, I can't argue with anything he said. I think um, calling everyone is by far the most important because, um, I mean, he wrote about Jim Thorpe, everyone's dead, which makes it a little more complicated. I'm writing about a guy, Bo Jackson, and 90% of people are alive. And I think the uh, the key is getting new stories. Uh, I always say, um, this dates back to my Brett Favre biography. There was some free agent running back in camp from, we'll just say Bucknell, with Brett Favre in Green Bay for three weeks. And that guy's going to remember absolutely every single thing about his encounters with Brett Favre, the time he picked up a napkin for him or the time he gave him French fries. And Brett Favre isn't going to remember that guy the day after he leaves. I think those people are really important. Those stories are really telling. And what people experienced in small capsules of time are really telling. And when people become famous, people remember, their mem- people have very profound, pronounced, and embedded memories of them. So I think that's really, really important because that's where you get the fresh material. And um, I also do agree with David, like you, you, uh, you want to go to the scene as much as you can. You want to be able to describe the scene. You want to be able to, this sounds corny, but like smell it and feel it and taste it and understand sure. what it was like to enter a stadium that he entered or understand what it was like to live where he lived or she lived. So um, the more tangible a subject becomes, the better off you are. Yeah, and I think in terms of going there too, be it uh, the scene of an accident or um, uh, just let's just say a football stadium at a particular time of year, I think it's all the more important too, if you can, to get there like at the time of day that a certain thing happened, ideally in that season, because like you said, to get the smell of it, it's going to smell different depending on what month it is. Uh, you know, there could be a whiff of, you know, whatever manure coming off a field in one particular season versus another. And that just layers on detail that just makes everything about it so much more evocative. The thing is like, all right. So Dave, Dave Marinus is one of the best ever, you know, and he just throws everything he has into a book. And I try to do that too. I'm not as good as him, but I try to throw everything I have into a book. Jonathan, I a really good friend of mine, Ali biographer, throws everything in. Howard Bryant throws everything in. John Wertham. Like the people who make it in this profession throw everything they have into a book, everything they have into a book where you definitely, I can't speak for those guys, but I know I personally start losing my mind (laughs) where all I want to do is talk (laughs) about focus, read about this person. And if I feel like, I almost feel like start feeling like if I miss an hour or I miss a day, I get panicked that what did I miss out? What did I, am I being lazy? all that stuff. So you really have to absorb it all, just absorb it all. And um, it's a weird, trippy experience. It really is. What have you found helpful about tracking down those marginalized, not marginalized in terms of just not popular uh, sources? Like you said, that anecdote about like a running back from Bucknell, like, that's a hard person to find, especially if they're not on social media or, or something that can be, like I said, very hard to find that the detective work to do, do that is taxing. So, uh, you know, what has been helpful for you to find those people? Oh man. Well, uh, there's a, if you go to white pages dot, dot, uh, com, they have an executive membership, right? And it's a really good search tool because it gives you cell numbers. When I started doing this, all I needed was a home number. Now home numbers are obsolete. So the whitepages.com executive membership, sound numbers. Classmates.com is this amazing database of yearbooks. So you can put in Auburn or someone so high school and oftentimes find yearbooks. That's very helpful. Um, Facebook, obviously invaluable as far as tracking people down, knowing where they are. I would disagree with you. I mean, I don't think you were making this argument, but um, finding like the fifth string quarterback from Auburn in 1984 who went on to have a construction business is actually finding him is far easier than finding like some guy who played seven years in the NFL because a guy mm-hmm. who, who has a construction business is so happy to be talking to you and he hasn't been spoken to about this subject maybe in 30 years. So you track down the guy, Barry Smith from blah, blah, plumbing. Oh, you want to talk to me? I mean, if you have time, yeah, I got a bow story. Did ever, anyone ever tell you about the licorice? And you're like, no, and then you're on your way. So those guys are just usually, they fill in a lot of moments 
Like those little stories, those little tiny stories. Oh, I remember the time Bo did this. I remember the time Bo did that, this and that. Those things are so important and valuable. David will tell you the same thing, I bet. And, you know, Robert Caro is famous for taking, you know, geez, you know, five, 10, 12 years to- That guy sucks. Overrated. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, kidding. It, it, what, what's, what's crazy is that he, you know, the research he does is Titanic, as it is for you, but he takes a long, long time and always has going all the way back to Robert Moses. And, you know, you, I, I believe you inter- had something like 700 interviews for this Bo Jackson book. Yeah. And, you know, you've researched and reported it and wrote it in, I don't know, two years. So like, how are, how are you able to, I don't know, just kind of put it, biography in a pressure cooker and get something that is this sort of dense with flavor in such a short amount of time? Honestly, I think it'd be a better question to ask him how he takes seven years, because honest to God. <laughs> I've never done crack, but I would start. Like I could not spend that long. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't do it. I just mentally, I couldn't, I don't know how I'd possibly do that. Also, I don't know how he affords to do it unless he's getting these like multi-million gazillion dollar payouts. But for me, I love the intensity. Like I actually like the intensity of being like, all right, I have seven interviews today. Okay, I have five interviews today. All right, today I'm just digging through clips. I'm gonna drink coffee dig through clips all day today. Like, I like it. I don't want to spread mm-hmm. it out. I don't want to take forever. I don't want to stretch my legs. I like the intensity of it all. So for me, it's like Bo Jackson. All right, I'm starting with McAdory High School. I'm going to go through that yearbook. I'm going to track down as many people as I can. I'm just going to call, 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 call. I'm going to get that done. And hopefully by um, within a month, I've taken care of high school. And I've interviewed everyone from high school. And now I'm going to move to Auburn. I'm going to do baseball first. And then I'm going to do football. Then I'll do track. I'm just going to call, 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 call. And if I have two bo- two years to write a book, a year and a half is just research and calling people and interviewing people. That's incredible. Yeah, that- uh, it's. I don't ha- think it's incredible. I don't, wait, this is- you don't? I just want to say, like, I really mean this. I really mean this. This is not me being humble or bashful or anything. Anyone can do this. I'm not saying some people are worse writers than me. Some people are better writers than me. Anyone can hustle and bust your ass. Like, that's the whole key to my career. That's all I like- from the day I got to Sports Illustrated, I knew there were better writers than me, but I always thought I can outwork you. And that's it. That's it. Just bust your ass. And all right, I'm going to call a million people. That's what I'm going to do. So when people say that's incredible, I'm like, honest to God, it's not. Incredible is, I don't know how to work documents as well as some of my colleagues. I don't know how to go into a library basement and know precisely where to go. That to me is much more incredible. I just call people. I'm just dogging. Yeah, it goes back to that where you shared on your your days with the in the bullpen how you found that directory of you yeah. know, sports information directors and you were just like, all right, alphabet, go A to Z. Let's call them up. And what uh, what interesting thing do you have, uh, you know, uh, tucked away under the rug that uh, that you'd like to share? And yeah, it's that that doggedness I think is um, it, it's a skill unto itself that uh, probably a lot of people dismiss. Uh, but it's maybe the most valuable skill you can bring to the table. Yeah, I learned that from my dad. My dad, uh, Stan Perlman, is kind of my hero. And um, he uh, he ran an executive search firm. He was basically a headhunter. And he was just always coming up with ways to find clients. He wrote a book. He self-published it. He, he did all these brochures. He wound up having a, a weekly or month, I guess it was probably a monthly business column in the local Gannett newspaper. He started doing newsletters. He would always have creative approaches and he wasn't afraid and he didn't mind sitting at his desk and just doing something on repeat, write a letter, repeat, write a letter, repeat, write a letter, repeat. It almost becomes a trance. And I, I haven't really thought about that until recently, but my dad really taught me that, the value of doggedness and just doing it and doing it and doing it. And it's not it's not drudgery if you're passionate about it. You know, I don't think, I honestly don't think, I'm not Kobe Bryant, I'm not making that comparison. I don't think he thought of the thousand jump shots as drudgery. I think he thought of it as a means to an end. And with calling people, and with tracking down articles, it's kind of a means to an end. I don't really mind it. Would you say you feel most alive and engaged when you're making those calls and interviewing? Uh, I, I mean, in the book world, yes. I mean, I would say the most alive is the day your book comes, like your finished product shows up. And that moment yeah. where you actually hold the book is as it actually lives up to what you would think. It truly does. But yeah, getting a great interview... I mean, with Bo, I'll tell you something with Bo Jackson was um, when I found out that Dick Schaap donated all his notes from Bo Knows Bo to the Auburn Library and they were sending them to me and this package arrives in the mail and it's just 
hours and hours and hours of recordings of him interviewing Bo Jackson, things that haven't been listened to in 30 years, uh, all the transcripts typed out, different articles, notes from Dick Schaap to the publisher. That's electrifying for me, like absolutely electrifying. Was that moment when you discovered that those were donated to Auburn, was that a moment that really cracked the code of this book? In a lot of ways, I think, yeah, actually, yes, because Bo Jackson didn't talk. So yeah, when that happens, you're like, well, like people ask when you promote a book, is that good? Is it helpful that he doesn't talk? No, never helpful. You want, you want as much info as possible. So getting those, it felt like I was interviewing 28-year-old Bo, which is invaluable. And I, I always like going to, you know, I've, sometimes I do it before I read the book, but uh, I, you know, just, but uh, I love going to the acknowledgments in, in that section and kind of getting a sense of uh, the team behind it. But also sometimes you get a really cool anecdote about, you know, the the composition or the generation of the book. And it was great when you got that phone call from Bo and, uh, you, you know, you're he was saying, you know, he, he said, uh, you know, everybody wants to do a Bo book, but nobody realizes how hard that would be. And uh, I wonder if maybe you can put into words how difficult it was to to do this Bo book. It's hard, but it's not like it's hard because it's Bo Jackson. It's hard because if you write a full book on somebody, it's hard. I mean, it's yeah. hard. It's a grind. And also, he's a grumpy, <laughs> you know, like contrarian a little bit. And he's he's not flowery and he's not out there telling everyone all his business. And so Walter Payton was very hard, but Walter Payton was kind of an open book in many ways. And Bo Jackson has never been an open book. I mean, Bo, Bo Jackson... Literally, the baseball team and football team, the Royals and uh, Raiders, did not have his phone number. Like, he was guarded, <laughs> guarded. And when you write about someone like that, also the other thing is, like, we had a really nice conversation. And I thought, oh, this is great. This is great. But I know it's different when a guy, when you're Bo Jackson, and maybe, like, your high school math teacher calls you up and says, hey, this guy called me. Or, like, your high school girlfriend calls you and says, hey, this guy called. It's different than just hearing someone wants to write a book on you. And I think it's a little unnerving for people. And I'm sure it was for him too. So like there were people I called and I know they checked with Bo and I never heard from them again. So I can probably assume, I did not assume at the time, I just kept moving straight ahead that maybe Bo told him, no, I don't know. Yeah, that's um, when I was talking to Howard Bryan about the Ricky Henderson book, which I know you did as well. Mm -hmm. You know, he had Ricky for a little while and then eventually got stonewalled and then Ricky was stonewalling everybody else, um, which throws a wrinkle into your operations. Um, but he had a great way of phrasing, you know, of lobbying like a major, major person. He was like, listen, Ricky, like a lot of people who are your fans, you know, they're maybe in their mid to late forties, their fifties, they remember you, but sooner or later, you know, people are going to forget who you are and this is why we need to like write about you know biographies need to write about you because people will forget your greatness and i wonder if that's something that you know that really resonates with you because uh you know a lot of these guys you know for us you and me yeah we remember bo but and if you know maybe another generation people will be like i know i remember he was this freak athlete but i don't know anything about him uh 100 percent. and i talked with howard about that you're right i love the way he said it like he, he, we've talked about that and he's really eloquent and measured with his words when Howard speaks, there's just real meaning to it. And um, I do agree. And it's almost like the thing is, okay, if Ricky Henderson is like, I don't want you writing a book. And Bo Jackson is like, I don't want you writing a book. Should you not write the book? And Howard's sort of take on it, which I agree with is they don't just own that history. Like that history belongs to us too, as sports fans, as kids who grew up, idolizing these guys uh, as kids who bought the posters, the sneakers, et cetera. Like that's our history too. Bo Jackson's history as an athlete is my history as a sports fan. You know, he doesn't own it. Ricky Anderson doesn't own his history. Um, they are public figures. And I, yeah, I, I hate the idea that kids don't know who Bo Jackson is. And the reality Bo Jackson wouldn't like to hear this is most kids don't know who Bo Jackson is. And the reality is most kids don't know who Ricky Anderson is. And I do think as, I don't, I would never be like the arrogant guy who calls himself a sports historian, but these are books that are technically sports history books. And I think there is a responsibility to remember the past in sports and in all areas. And I love how you open the book with, you know, the, the Chicago White Sox plane, you know, engines catching fire and they have to make an emergency landing. 
And um, it just gets to the point of, you know, those decisions we make as writers of how to how to get into a story. And um, how did you arrive at that decision to start start there with with that anecdote sort of bifurcated with two recollections? What was the decision behind that? Um, I guess there are two things. Number one, I uh, I do like the idea of opening a book with a little bit of a bang, like punching the reader across the face and saying, you should read this, you know, um, my Dallas Cowboy book started with Michael Irvin stabbing a stabbing a teammate in the neck with a pair of scissors. Uh, the bad guys one opens with with a actually a flight them returning from Houston and destroying a plane. You know you want to kind of grab the reader a little bit. This also spoke to something though because they're flying back from Anaheim after playing the Angels, and a bunch of guys told me about this plane that caught fire and it was documented. It did catch fire. The White Sox America West flight. And everyone's telling the story about Bo Jackson coming out of the cockpit. He was sitting with the pilots and telling everyone, you, everyone's going to be okay. Just get in your seat. You'll be okay. And it was this really heroic portrait of Bo Jackson. But then I heard an alternative memory, which is, no, he didn't come out of the cockpit. He ran up to the cockpit to save the plane. And in the mythological world of Bo Jackson, I argue maybe they're both true. Maybe he tried saving the plane in the cockpit and by leaving the cockpit. Maybe he climbed on the wing and started taping it up. Maybe... You know, whatever, he flew next to the plane. Like, he's just such a myth that these multiple stories both have sort of a weird bit of verification to them. I love the moment to where Carl- Carlton Fisk, who's just like, go get him, Bo. Go, like, get, him, go get him. I know. It's very <laughs> funny. It's very, I mean, yeah, it's very in character of Carlton Fisk. Yeah, and um, yeah, I love, I love digging into structure, too. And I think for a lot of your books, you know, you're big on, you're big on, like, just forward chronology. I know like one of, one of your more recent magazine pieces, you, you ran it, ran the tape backwards a la memento. And, um, but you know, given that you like a forward chronology, you know, for this book, was there any question of how you would go about structuring, uh, this book or was it pretty mapped out for you? I mean, I never structure, I don't even structure. Um, I've never mm-hmm. written an outline. I don't sit there and think it's going to go this way, but, uh, a life biography does come with a certain chronology which is life. So, you know, it was not, and it also branches off, like all of the books branch off um, where you could be in Chicago and all of a sudden, but here's a story that took him to Chicago or there's a, I wrote extensively about a college teammate of his name, Greg Pratt, a fullback who died in a conditioning drill. And that chapter, which is really moving to me, sort of sidesteps into Greg Pratt's history and then Greg Pratt's funeral and the, the team getting off the bus in Georgia and everyone crying and sobbing. So, it, it twists and turns, but you always know there's a point you're heading toward, which is modern times. Yeah, that uh, I have Greg Pratt in my notes, and that was uh, an incredible chapter and incredibly, you know, touching and a great, you know, sort of micro profile of him in that moment. And it kind of, well, there's two things I want to talk about about that, but I'll, t- I'll talk about this one thing first is when there are stories of this nature that are a spur or a tributary off your central figure you could go into any myriad deep dives on ancillary characters. um, But eventually you do have to pull it back to your main guy. Uh, What is the, use a math term, maybe the the calculus you use to, mm, to be like, all right, this person does deserve some time in the sun, but eventually I have to kind of reel that back in and get back to Bo. I don't have any, I really don't have it. I just do it. Um, I just do. I mean, if it goes too long, you cut some paragraphs and you kind of maybe an editor comes along and says, I think you went too wide here. But I don't know. I just kind of like a leaf in the wind sometimes a little bit. You just write it and you kind of roll with it and hope it works out okay. The one thing I will say, and I consider the Greg Pratt story my best example of this, the name Greg Pratt does not appear in Bo Jackson's autobiography, right? Bo knows Bo. He literally had a teammate die who he was close with in conditioning drills the same day Bo was running. Uh, Bo went to the hospital, was devastated by his death, went to the funeral, pulled out a Kodak uh, disposable camera, took a picture of Greg Pratt lying in his casket, open casket at the funeral, was absolutely devastated by this whole thing. It's not even a mention in Bo Jackson's autobiography. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, Bo, you write an autobiography, you have every right to write about what you want to write about and every right to leave stuff out if you feel comfortable. But I think that's why biographies are important because that's a key, key moment in his life He chose to leave it out for some reason, but in a storytelling sense, it can't be left out. 
because it sort of changed who he was and made this major imprint on who he was. So I think that's why biographies, that's why I'm with the Howard Bryant team. I think biographies matter. And I think he, I, I am allowed to tell this story. And Bo Jackson may say, well, you didn't get it right. And that's fair. But I'm allowed to tell this story. Yeah, and that that was the other point I was uh, wanted you to underscore with uh, with Greg Pratt was that yes, and you know if we allow those central people to control unilaterally these public figures to control unilaterally that narrative, what they leave out while not technically lying is not paying. It's almost a lie by omission, and we don't get the full picture. And so your three dimensional reporting it brings out this uh you know this this young man who died which is i don't know it, it's a very telling and very you know formative moment in the life of bo jackson that he wasn't as forthright but you know i think it fills in the holes and rounds out his character all the more in the totality of the last folk hero yeah i 100 percent agree and again like i don't he doesn't he's under no obligation to tell that story you know like i, I right i'm not mad at him for not telling it i don't i don't even think it's wrong not to tell it but i think you know, there's another, like, this is an example. I'm not dogging Bo Jackson, I just want to say, at all. I have nothing but respect for Bo Jackson. But I also think, like, in his autobiography, he writes about his early baseball struggles at Auburn. And he wrote about going 0 for 21 with 21 strikeouts in his first 21 at-bats, which is amazing. And it's one of the great streaks of futility I've ever read about for a guy who became a star, to go 0 for 21 with 21 strikeouts. And I interviewed different people from that era who were like, yeah, it's crazy, over 21, over 21. And it would be even crazier if it were true. But it's not true. He, in his first game, he, had, he went two for five in his first game against uh, Southern Illinois. His first hit, and it, he had his first hit in his first at-bat. It's actually funny. His first step, uh, hit in college was a grounder to shortstop that he beat out. His first hit in the majors was a grounder to second that he beat out. And I, don't, I certainly have no reason at all to think Bo Jackson was lying to exaggerate. I just think memory is funny. And if you don't fact check yourself, like the other day, Bo was on Rich Eisen's show. Again, he was great and he's awesome and he's cool. But he told a story about Rich asked what his biggest moment as a major leader was. I think that was the question. And he said, he gave a date, something, something, 1990. When I, um, I, we were playing the Brewers in Kansas City and I intentionally got myself thrown out of the game because I wanted to be at my daughter's, uh, the birth of my daughter. And I thought, well, that's an interesting story. And then you look it up. Well, the Royals weren't playing the Brewers that day, and Bo Jackson wasn't even active. So hmm. I just think, again, I'm not dogging Bo Jackson, like, at all. He is not lying. He's just misremembering, and it happens to all of us with time. But I do think biography is important, and we have – there are ways biographies truly contribute in very honest, important ways to storytelling. Yeah, like uh, I remember seeing Bo play at Fenway Park and see, I don't remember if, well, I, I do remember him doing this. He was just, he had fallen on the ground or something. He was just on his back and he snapped himself like up somehow. Like he just like yeah, yeah, yeah. bent yeah. his and just flipped up. He was somehow on his feet. And I don't know if I saw that on TV or if I saw that actually at Fenway. Right. And uh, but it is like it gets to your point of like kind of misremembering it. Maybe I, I, I got to say, like, oh, right, dad, do you remember this? Did this happen in person? And so you kind of round it out. But it's easy to see how you can uh, the the past can get a little bit muddy. Memory is very tricky. And it's the flaw of these books, too. Like, I'm well aware it's a flaw of these books. Like you remember the best you can. People remember the best they can. They tell you their stories. You verify as much as possible. But there's also some you're also going a little bit on faith that they remember it. And you're also going a little bit with, this may not be exact. When someone tells me a quote, when someone tells me a conversation they had with Bo Jackson, I might, you know, oh, and then Bo came into my office and I said to him, Bo, you need to play harder. And Bo said, all right, man, I'll play harder. Like I'll use a conversation, but with the awareness that there's no possible way it's precise. It can't be, it, it's just very unlikely that someone remembers verbatim. I can't tell you what I talked to my wife about 10 minutes ago, not verbatim. So there are little leaps that people make in biography, and that's okay. It just comes with the turf, I think. It's uh, given that there isn't. You know, he's such a re reticent figure, even even by the standards of the day. You know, there were some unsavory details of his upbringing that I that I don't I don't judge him for. I I like those details that round out a figure and makes him more human. So when you're doing that kind of reporting and you're looking to dig into the past, not to 
smear anyone's reputation, but to just get them into their whole totality. You know, what becomes the challenge for you as you're interviewing someone like his, you know, fiance Allison at, at Auburn or other people who maybe he bullied growing up to, you know, to round them out while also not, you know, totally trying to, you know, have a character assassination. I think the thing that's interesting is I was fully aware. So Allison Hines was his fiance and he ended up not getting married to her. And there was some, you know, some weird stuff there. I think it comes with the understanding, at least when I was reporting it, certainly when I was writing it, that we're all a bunch of assholes in college. You know, right? we are, we just are like my, my college girlfriend cheated on me. And at the time I was devastated, right? Like devastated, destroyed, blah, blah, blah. And then later I was like, oh yeah, we were in college. Like that's, that's age appropriate. You know, like that's okay. It happened in college. So I think like his weird actions in college, like he had this fiance, then he had another fiance. He took this one, one place. He took this one somewhere. I'm not saying it's like idyllic uh, behavior, but like it's college. Like it happened in college. He's been a, by all accounts, a very good and devoted husband and father since. It's the same thing. Like he got money. These all guys were all getting money from boosters in college. Like all of them, they were getting paid. There were handshakes coming off the field. It's not an indictment of his character. As I say in the book, the guy grew up dirt poor in Bessemer, Alabama, right? Living in a three room house. If he took money from a booster, if you want to criticize someone, go after the booster. Cause I can't criticize Bo Jackson for doing it. So I just think it's a context of it all. It doesn't feel scandalous through the prism I think I present it, I guess. Yeah, well, for sure, especially for someone who, you know, wore his sister's shoes and wore socks right. to, to school. Like, geez, I mean, why why wouldn't you? It would be <laughs> almost silly not to. Well, you know what? I, uh, you say, know. I covered Major League Baseball, and I used to be a steroid hardliner. If you use steroids, you should be gone. If you use steroids, say blah, 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 blah. And now I think about it more. I'm not pro using steroids, but like you're a guy from the Dominican. Okay. You're one of three kids or whatever. Your dad makes pennies a day. You live in poverty and here's this way you can take care of your family for life. And you just have to use this steroid drug and it sucks that you have to use it, but it'll make your family wealthy for life. And your dad is literally working, making crap money. I get it. Like I actually get it. So I get you're poor a booster comes along. It's against NCA rules. Why do I give a shit about NCA rules? My mom needs to eat. I get it. And uh, what was fun about reading this book for me anyway, it was like some of the incidents I did, like I incidents, like some of his athletic ex exploits. Uh, I didn't fully remember. And I would read your description. Then I would like have my phone out at the same time. And I would like go to YouTube and I would watch it. And it just made for like a really good experience. Usually I like to divorce, you know, like a book yeah. from the phone or a book from digital. But in this case, it seemed to be so complimentary. And it was actually like, that was a really fun aspect of reading this book. Oh man. My favorite, you know, in many ways, my favorite Bo Jackson play, his first major league at bat, which I keep saying, I said oh. it to Andrew Murray football. It's a rock opera. It's like an opera. And he's facing this 321 game winner, just holding on for dear life. Steve Carlton. He has, he has no idea who Steve Carlton is. Um, Steve Carlton looks like a lumpy old man. Bo Jackson looks like a human muscle. Um, it's in Kansas City. And just like the back and forth. Bo Jackson at one point taking a bat. I We try, We all tried this at home. I swear to God. Take a bat. Extend it out front with your two hands on the head and on the knob. And he just brought it back twice to his butt without bending his arms. And brought it back. And brought it back. He hits this foul ball that looks like it's a homer. It goes a million miles. He gets a standing ovation. And then he beats out a grounder to second for his first major league hit it's it's just preposterous so um and then you watch it and you're like oh it actually is preposterous like it actually lives up to everything i just wrote because it's crazy 3.6 seconds like that is so uncannily fast down the line especially from the right batter's box i you know four seconds three nine yeah. is getting down the line like oh. that is no joke speed and the fact that he got at his size could run that fast on a ball that was hit on astroturf very firmly to second base and he still beat it by a step or two it's just it's an uncanny feat a very understated athleticism but if you're in the know you're like holy shit that's incredible wait i can always i always do this i just go on the i go on the runoff of stuff he did that blows my mind and like i'm just saying right now his first major league hit, he runs a 3-6. It's the second fastest recorded time for righty from home to first in major league history. And it's his first hit. He, in high school, he wins back-to-back -back state decathlon championships both time 
without doing the last event, the 1500, which he didn't want to do. So he deliberately got as far ahead as possible. The second time he won the state decathlon championship was on a sprained ankle. The day after winning the decathlon championship on a sprained ankle, he pitched his only game of the year for McAdory High School in a state playoff game, struck out 13 in a win. By the way, in his, in his baseball career, Justin McAdory, his senior year, he had 20 home runs, which is a national record. He did it in only 25 games because he missed seven to do track events. And in his lifetime in McAdory, he stole 90 out of 91 bases. Like, <laughs> and that's like a sliver of a sliver of a sliver of the Bo Jackson athletic story. It, it just blows my mind that we didn't get to see him longer uh, just based on the, the devastating injury that he suffered while playing the Bengals. The, oh, shoot, I'm something necrosis. What uh, the, his hip? I've actually learned it. Yeah. And it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, a, you know, for anyone who does, like, I, did, I knew he hurt his hip bad, but I didn't realize it was basically like, losing your blood supply to a joint which effectively starts its decomposition so i don't know maybe you can speak to the gravity of that injury and you know how it derailed uh maybe the greatest athlete we've ever seen yeah i would say no maybe i would say greatest athlete we've ever seen um and maybe it's just because i wrote the book but that's how i feel and um he uh, a couple of days you know he has the injury in a game against the cincinnati Bengals, a playoff game but one of my favorite things is um the next week the, the Raiders go to Buffalo to play in the AFC championship game. It's, it's freezing in Buffalo and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's cold and Bo Jackson's on the sideline. And the final score of that game is uh, 51 to three bills. They destroy the Raiders. And I had one teammate, I don't remember who it was with the Raiders say it's a different game as Bo in and if Bo is in there. And I'm like, buddy, you lost 51 to three. Bo Jackson is not scoring you. <laughs> 48 points. I don't care how great he was. You're not going to win that game. Um, but, you know, he he hurts the leg, and he's, like, hanging around the, Laker, the Raiders locker room. Like, they didn't think to immediately take him to a hospital. And when he goes the next day and he has a scan, a doctor goes, do you see a boat? They're looking at this x-ray, and he says, do you see this whole black area here? And Bo goes, yeah. He goes, that is all blood. And Bo Jackson felt like he was going to pass out. It was an insanely debilitating injury. He wound up ultimately getting a fake hip and playing on a fake hip. He could never play in the NFL again. It killed a great career. But I will say one argument I will make is if Bo Jackson winds up Eric Dickerson in football, and let's say he winds up uh, Gary Sheffield in baseball, he's not nearly as interesting. The whole mystique is what's interesting and the intrigue and what he could have been. That's the whole story. I think if he had just played those two sports, he'd be a fascinating figure, but I don't think he'd be an icon. I think he's an icon in a way for the brevity of it all. Absolutely. Well, it's like, you know, we were talking about Marinus earlier and getting beyond the mythology. But uh, with Bo, it's like he it, it is the mythology that makes makes him so fascinating. And so maybe it's like you almost don't want to get through the mythology because that would that would ruin how we remember Bo Jackson. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. And also, like, again, I tell the story about him hitting a ball so high that he was a third by the time it popped up. Right. And. If we had TikTok back then or cell phones or whatever, maybe it was just maybe the wind took it and the ball went over the fence and then came back and he was running a third, but the umpire gave him it was a ground rule double and the umpire gave him third accidentally. Like, we don't know that. Like, that's kind of the beauty of it all. You know, like we don't see it. So we tell stories and we tell tall tales. And did Babe Ruth really have a pointed shot? Did Earl Marigot really grab a quarter off the top of the backboard? We don't know. And it's kind of fun that way. You know, I had Tom Flores, the coach of the Raiders, tell a story about Bo running a 419, then a 417 on grass in pads. Now, I had people verify that. But can I guarantee you with 100% certainty that he ran a 417 on grass in pads after running a 419 seconds earlier? No. Do I think it happened? Yeah. But that's part of the mystique. <laughs> and I just got a couple more things for you, Jeff, and I'll let you get on with your. Your, uh, the rest of your media onslaught. Um, that, this one's just more of like a writing advice type question. And I was in that same interview with, uh, that, well, the same quote from Lee Child, they were interviewing Lee and his son, Andrew, who kind of co-write their books. Yeah. They were asked about their relationship about, well, some of the best writing advice they've received. And, you know, Lee said something, but Andrew said something that was more or less 
uh, you know, basically the best advice you can follow is just your own experience in, in doing it in, um, you know, and then following too much advice is actually debilitating, such as my interpretation of it. And as someone who teaches and someone who no doubt, uh, uh, elicit or people solicit advice from you just based on your success, you know, what is your relationship to offering it and maybe even, you know, receiving it yourself? I'm fine with it. <laughs> I don't know. It's, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I honestly, like, I'm not, I'm almost the worst writer for this podcast in many ways because I'm not a, I'm not one of those writers who's like analyzing everything about writing. And I'm not one of those, mm-hmm. like, I have a friend who I love, but who refers to what we do as a craft. And I recoil every time I hear that. Like, <laughs> I'm not, Hemingway was a craftsman. I am not, you know, I'm a bricklayer. And, mm-hmm. So I'm not like, oh, the blah, blah, blah of writing and the key, blah, blah, blah. I know it's hard. I know it drains me. I know it beats the shit out of me. And I know I'm so preposterously fortunate that I get to do this for a living. Like, it's a joke. My life is a joke. So I, I'm just not, I don't even have a great answer because I'm not that guy. Very nice. And uh, as Jeff, as I always like to bring these conversations down for a landing, I love asking uh, guests of, uh, like you just for a recommendation of some kind for the listeners out there. And like it can be anything from a brand of socks you're into or a brand of coffee or a fanny pack. So it's like a whatever, whatever is exciting you these days. I'd see if you have a recommendation for the listeners. I'm going to give you a recommendation because I have this right in front of me. This is a thing to do. Okay. Is that all right? Nice. Thing to do. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I have since 1996 kept diaries. I've kept it a uh, very vigorous diaries. Now, sometimes I take a month off and I get back to it, but I've kept diaries, 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 diaries. And I just started my 25th diary. Nice. And, and when I'm like on the toilet or bored or brushing my teeth or whatever, I'll pull out an old diary and I'll read about the birth of my son. I'll read about 9-11. I'll read about some day in July of 2012 when I mowed the lawn and cut my foot. And I just find that we forget 99% of the things we do in life and diaries allow us not to. And I cannot recommend strongly enough, like times a million, to keep a diary. It's a life-changing experience, and it also gives you something, hopefully, if they can read my handwriting, to pass down to your kids and grandkids and maybe even great-grandkids after you're gone. So I'm I'm huge on the diary front. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've kept one since 97. Wow, really? Yeah. We're the two. Yeah. Because usually you don't find them. I'm not being, I hope this isn't a sexist. You don't find that many men who are diary keepers compared to women. I mean, many more women Mm -hmm. in diaries than men. That might be cultural in some way, but good for you, man. It's a way to go. Yeah. It started uh, because my buddy did uh, the luge of all things Uh and he would and he would go to europe he was actually pretty good so he would go to europe with the the junior national team and i started i called it the omera chronicles and i would just um i was just keeping notes of what was happening during the day while he was away and i mailed it to him and he read it and he got a kick out of it and he sent it back and then i just kept going at that point i was like oh this is kind of cool to keep a log of what's been happening and and that's just evolved over the years and unfortunately what happened one time oh no when my wife and I moved out to Oregon, we had to ship a bunch of stuff from the East Coast, and uh, FedEx um, spilled a bunch of shit on one of the boxes with all my journals, and they lost one of them. Uh... So I lost like a, from 2008 to 2009, like that journal in there. Uh, fortunately, that was the only one, but like, uh, yeah. so I have every other one, but uh, yeah, FedEx, uh, they, they, uh, they, sullied one uh, sullied many and lost one which uh yeah was yeah. pretty sad day <laughs> i'll tell you one thing i do for that sucks by the way that totally sucks i'd be furious and probably never use fedex again but i am um, like i'm in new york city now right i swear to god i'm not like this is true like i'll walk around the city and if i see like a sticker on a pole that has some sort of something about it i'll peel the sticker off the pole you know just like a telephone pole and put it in my diary later and you have like these time period pieces Maybe it's an ad. Maybe it's an internet thing. Maybe it's a candidate running for office. I like adding those to my diary so there's some texture and stuff to look at besides just my writing. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, somehow I'll put, like, I'll tape in receipts from a cool, yeah. like, bakery I went to. You know, all that stuff is just, uh, well, it's kind of like a, a reporter's documentation of what's going on. And he's like, you, as Marinus says, like, get the documents. It's like, oh, these are kind of like little documents of your life. My wife didn't <laughs> like that I... Uh, I took the band-aids after I got COVID shot and taped them in the diary. <laughs> so like that crosses the line. I'm like, so I have like, I shave my head every now and then I'll take like some gray hair, tape it in the diary, you know, like just weird stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, very nice. Well, Jeff, man, what a, what a great, uh, great book. I had so much fun reading it and reliving Bo's life. And it was 
just uh, amazing to talk to you about it and how you go about the work. So thanks so much for the time and thanks for the book. It was uh, amazing. My pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me on. Hey, thanks, CNF. Thanks to the great Jeff Perlman. He's at Jeff Perlman on Twitter and at Jeff underscore Perlman on Instagram. Name of the book, again, is The Last Folk Hero, The Life and Myth of Bo Jackson. It is published by Mariner. Hope you had a chance to check out that Remembering Matt Tullis episode from last week. You don't necessarily have to listen to the re-upped interview portion, uh, but the audio obituary, which is about 20 minutes long, features Ben Montgomery, Kim Cross, Michael Graff, Mike Sager, and Glenn Stout. They speak to, they speak of Matt and of the legacy he left behind. Big loss for the CNF and community, but uh, did our little part here to try to remember Matt and what he stood for. All right, so I'm still in New Jersey, going to be here for another another full week and then another full week of driving to get back to our what we consider our true home in Oregon. I've been recording on my little minor league microphone here, but it does okay. We'll call it a AAA microphone, just waiting to get called up. It's decent. I bet if I didn't even draw attention to it, you wouldn't even know. Dealing with the moms and the dementia and the selling of her house to pay for her care, yada, yada, yada. Uh, But while I was visiting her, she had to be transported to the hospital because her kidneys were failing. Not like, holy shit, get her there in 10 minutes or she's going to die. But it was just like, yeah, she needs the care that an emergency room and then uh, a weekend stay at a nice hospital can provide. She needed fluids, some meds. But they didn't get the memo that she needs Xanax to be level and semi-normal and certainly not on edge. So naturally, she um, slapped a nurse, pinched a nurse in the face, and was refusing her meds. Awesome. <laughs> my, uh, She thought that my sister was trying to poison her with meds because eventually the nurse, she wasn't doing anything with nurses. Nurses were like, maybe, bro, maybe my sister, maybe you can do it. And then my mom was saying, I'm going to go down to the pharmacy and I'm going to talk to the pharmacist about this. You can't just take anything that they give you. You can't just trust all these doctors. And for one, I haven't even seen a doctor to which we're like, you've seen a doctor several times. These nurses are here all the time. I haven't seen any nurse. And like, she was just here. And you just have to be calm and patient and you, you can't reason. You just have to. You just have to kind of bear the brunt of it. This went on for something like an hour on one day, and then another day it was pretty. It was altogether an, a, another, another a whole other thing. But in this one particular day, eventually I was, I came out of the bullpen, and I, I told her that, like frankly, you know, kidneys clean your blood, and if your blood doesn't get clean, you will die. And eventually, she did take her Xanax, and then some other meds that were helping with her kidneys. I think that was it then. Oh, yes. As we're both, my both being, my sister and I, were just sitting in the room, you know, forever watching the Hallmark Channel. And then my mom looks me in the eye, points her finger at me, and starts to creepily whistle Silent Night. He was going like, I looked over at my sister wide-eyed like, what the fuck is going on? But then she kept whistling the entire song before laying down. Like, without blinking, she fundamentally ruined that song for me. And if I, by extension, have ruined that song for you, I'm very, very sorry. I will never hear it again without picturing my mother performing it like she was a possessed demon. A little while after that, she mouthed to me, so she lied down. My sister wasn't paying attention. She was in the corner, and then my mom looks at me and mouths. She didn't say it out loud, but I quote, nevertheless, she called. She pointed over to my sister, and she goes, she's a fucking bitch. I said, oh, no, Mom, that's not true. You don't mean that. She eventually fell asleep and was singing Silent Night in her dreams. We soon left. I told my sister what my mom mouthed, and she was just like, come on. 
in our separate cars, on our separate trips to separate living quarters, we both had ourselves what we like to consider a good cry. This all, all this shit is real tough to witness, man. So that's why we put these little parting shots at the end of the show, because who would keep listening if they were at the beginning? Anyway, stay wild, CNFers, and if you can do, interview. See ya. See ya.